for ethics and human values, first uh, care panel of the um, semester. I'm really excited to have you all. As people are populating the um, session, I just want to let you know about what to expect for the next hour and 15 minutes. Um, the, uh, the care programming um, is presented with support from the College of Medicine Center for Bioethics, the College of Public Health, and the Center for Clinical and Translational Sciences, and we're really grateful for their support. And today we're going to be talking about something that I have like a lot of questions about. Um, so I'm really excited to um, have uh, the sort of experts um, in our midst to ask these questions. Um, so, I mean, so this panel is going to discuss whether we should really think about the ethics of um, using research, like conducting research on social media data, publicly available social media data as human subjects research, what governance structures are best equipped to support responsible conduct of research, and how researchers negotiate potential um, privacy concerns and other risks that are associated with conducting this research. Um, these are all really tricky questions and they keep on coming up and we keep on reading new and new like um, uh, newspaper articles about these massive data sets that are sharing a lot of information that we had, I had been sharing myself on my like, you know, you know, 300 follower, whatever, Instagram, but then <laughs> Once it becomes publicly available, I'm like scratching my heads and wondering, um, is this ethical? So we'll talk about those sorts of questions today. And I'm delighted to have uh, Dr. Michael Zimmer, who is our expert um, uh, outside panelist. He's a, prof a professor of computer science um, at Marquette University and also is the director of the Center for Data Ethics and Society. Um, Dr. Zimmer is going to present first, um, just give us an overview of some of these ethical questions and maybe talk over some case studies. And then we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Bayer, who is an associate professor in the School of Communication and um, also um, a fellow uh, or core faculty, sorry, at the Translational Data Analytics Institute, TDAI, at the Ohio State University. And Joe also directs the Mobile Social Cognition Lab, um, which combines digital and ecological survey methods to study mental processes um, that underlie the social connectedness in daily life. Um, and we also have as our expert OSU panelist, Dr. Jesse Fox, who's um, also an associate professor at the School of Communication um, at OSU and is the director of the Virtual Environmental and Communication Technology um, and Online Research Vector Lab. And both of them are going to, first we're gonna have um, Michael present a little bit about the overview of some of these ethical issues. And then we're going to get the perspectives of Joe and Jesse about the way in which they've been thinking about these issues, why this kind of research is really important, what it could teach us and how to conduct it responsibly. I have a few preset questions that we're going to sort of go over, um, but then also participants, there is opportunity and we've expanded the conversation to an hour and 15 minutes. So there should be around 25 to 30 minutes at the end for um, audience uh, questions. Throughout the panel, if you have a question, please feel free to um, type it up in the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. and. I think that is all to no further ado. Um, Michael, do you wanna start us off? I will, thank you so much, Dan. And thanks for inviting me to, to share with this, this community. I see we've got almost a hundred people um, in attendance uh, today. Um, and if everything worked well across the street, I have 200 students that are watching us right now uh, talking about these issues around how are we using data ethically. So I'm excited to be able to share some of the work that me and my colleagues have been uh, doing over the last few years, kind of unpacking some of these challenges about um, conceptual gaps. Re really, this is the thing that I focus most on, that when we start embracing data, different types of data, especially from different kinds of disciplines, and I'm glad we have some different disciplines you know, on our panel and, and I, I'm sure in the audience, um, thinking about how we use social media, how we use different kinds of big data, and how it's sort of stretching our thinking a little bit around, around research ethics. 
my starting point um, when I'm thinking about things like big data and social data is often this essay uh, from Wired magazine from 2008. And Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired at the time, wrote this very provocative piece talking about how because of the rise of big data, um, we basically don't need theory. He was pushing that we really don't need the scientific method to test hypotheses and run small scale experiments uh, to try to understand the world because now we're just so rich in data um, and that big data gives us a complete picture. It gives us the kinds of insights that we would never be able to get by just surveying consumer behavior or how people are voting or how they feel about a certain social issue. We can just look at their data and come to these conclusions. Now, this essay is really kind of provocative. I spend a lot of time in my classes actually poking all the holes in this, but it does give us a sense of how important data has become and how different fields, especially around research and social science research has embraced data this whole domain of computational social science you know, has emerged where our colleagues in communication or political science, um, economics um, can now embrace uh, large data sets, um, large sets of data that are much more uh, finely detailed than they ever could before. We're able to try to understand these really complicated social uh, cultural questions through a lens of data um, that was never really provided until the last maybe five or 10 years. Um, and this is largely because of our ability to leverage things like um, big data sets uh, to do this. There's been lots of studies over the last few years, Dana mentioned how we see things in the news all the time, um, handfuls of different kinds of studies that I've looked at, um, I've written about, other colleagues of mine have written about, where social scientists are trying to answer some kind of really interesting question about the world. Um, and they're using social data to do this. They might be using uh, social media content. They might be using text messages. Um, they might be um, engaging in experiments of manipulating people's feeds to see how they react and how they respond to things. I'm not gonna go into all of these in detail, because there's also just too many of them. Um, but, but some of these we can reflect back on, we can refer to in our discussion. I have a few newer examples I'm gonna close with at the end of my, my few minutes here. Um, but there's lots of um, cases where researchers trying to study something, trying to engage with new data sources to try to gain a better understanding and all generally trying to do good, good work you know, trying to answer tough questions using the resources available to them to make some sense out of the world. In each of these kinds of cases, and I'm sure some of those headlines jumped out at a few of you that have been, been watching this space over the last few years, um, have sparked ethical controversy, whether it's the Cambridge Analytica case um, or the OKCupid okay case that we could talk about a little bit more um, or people taking uh, images of faces to try to train an algorithm to guess someone's sexuality somehow based on facial features. Um, lots of very um, kind of provocative ethical issues emerge when we start using data in these kinds of ways. Um, three things I wanna focus on in terms of why I think this is a really um, important thing for us to pay attention to and makes it interesting for me as, a, as, a, as someone who studies data and research ethics. Um, this all gets really hard and complicated uh, because the way that we get the data, because of how we're approaching questions of ethics and just how do we even think about potential harms in the first place. So one of the real unique aspects of the ability to use this kind of social data or any kind of big data is just how easy it's become. Um, I think about, you know, 30 years ago, if you wanted to do anything with large data sets about people, that meant you were probably like a genomics researcher and you had millions of dollars of NIH funding and you got access to the human genome and that's how you were doing individual data analysis. Um, it was really expensive, it was really hard. Only people that had already been like established researchers got access to that kind of data. Now I can ask one of my undergraduates to write a Python script and go get me 100,000 Instagram uh, uh, profile images or go scrape uh, the, the Reddit subreddit about depression uh, and give me what everyone's saying in the last 30 days about their mood. 
um, it's become so much easier to collect huge amounts of data. Um, and that can be really important and really powerful for researchers. But that makes it really challenging when we have websites dedicated to sharing and collecting data sets. That means I can go find a data set about just about anything that I want. Um, and there will be one out there for me to have. It takes very little cost, very little energy, and there's often very little attention being paid to where that data is coming from uh, or why that information maybe was shared online in the first place. Because now we just have these simple, nice, clean data sets um, that I can just download and start playing with in R um, and go on in my research. There's been some sort of distance put in between me as a researcher and the human subjects that that data is based on. And that's gonna be a really interesting thing for us to sort of be thinking about. What is the nature of this data? And what does it mean when it's so easy to get it? Um, and, and I don't really need to even engage with a human to get access to what could be uh, quite sensitive uh, or personal information. Now, the other way that this becomes a challenge is that the data is increasingly what we call pervasive. Um, we try to avoid talking about big data when we talk about the kind of data about people that I think is of interest to most people on this call. Uh, we talk about pervasive data. It's data that pervades all aspects of our lives. Um, it's often very rich and detailed. It's often collected in ways that we may not even recognize or remember that I had signed up for some service or that my Apple Watch is collecting some piece of data that I completely forgot about or I'm not paying attention to, so I don't even know it's really being captured and collected. Um, this is a new kind of data that's being used for research purposes. Again, creating some really amazing insights and the amount of detail and the amount of in, uh, information we can get from things like our wearable devices or interactions with certain websites or th things that we post online um, provide an incredible amount of, of, of rich data for research purposes. But it's often how these things cross boundaries, different aspects and, and, and contexts of my daily existence are now being commingled in these data sets. And that's creating a lot of unique challenges for us as researchers as well. When I think about these challenges, um, I go all the way back to when I was studying philosophy of technology uh, in, in grad school. I came across this really important paper uh, that Jim Moore wrote in 1985 about what is computer ethics. Um, and this was like this pivotal moment when computing technology was becoming much more popular, um, much more digital and, 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 and basically at the personal level. And he was recognizing that we've had computers for a long time, we've had ethics for centuries, but there's something unique happening when we start talking about these new kinds of computer technologies that were emerging at the time. And what does that do to how we think about ethics? He talked about that we end up with these conceptual gaps, things that we thought we had figured out long ago about maybe intellectual property or um, free speech, um, or things like privacy suddenly get really muddled and really complicated when we start throwing in digital technologies. If you're old enough like me to remember the emergence of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and platforms like Napster and what such a, a change that caused and how we even think about intellectual property, um, a, a legal and policy concept that we thought was long settled suddenly became totally into flux. That's kind of what we're seeing now, um, I argue, when we talk about this kind of digital data that we're using uh, for research purposes. I think we have some pretty significant conceptual gaps on issues that we thought we had kind of settled when it comes to research ethics, things like privacy, things like consent, and things like the nature of harm in human subjects. So I want to just quickly highlight what I mean here, and then I'll share a couple more examples, and then we can turn it to our, our broader discussion. Um, but a lot of my work is looking at privacy and looking at how often we see arguments that because you share something online, uh, you must not have any more expectation of privacy. Uh, we see examples of people gathering data, collecting data. We see even IRBs, uh, ethical review boards saying, because that data was shared online, uh, you as a researcher do not have to think about privacy implications. 
that's a publicly accessible uh, YouTube video, you can go ahead and use it for your research. That's a common way that an IRB might review a research protocol. Um, I think this is very limiting, and I'm very concerned that we're viewing privacy still as very much a binary, as either a piece of information is public or it's private. Um, I push back against that. Um, I follow uh, the thinking that Helen Nissenbaum introduced with her theory of privacy as contextual integrity. That privacy is very contextual. It, it's you know There are moments when I'm going to share a piece of information with you, but I may not share that information with someone else. Uh, think about what you might share with your doctor versus what you're going to share with your roommate, uh, what you might share when you're applying for a bank loan uh, versus uh, when you're in the classroom uh, with a student or with a professor. We have different contexts that sort of govern what's appropriate to share and where that information goes. And that's how we need to be thinking about privacy. It's not an all or nothing kind of transaction. Um, and so a, a lot of the way that we look at this um, with, with my colleagues is that just because someone maybe posted something on their Instagram page with Dana's 300 followers does not necessarily mean that she's given up all expectations of privacy of that data. Now that gets really complicated and I understand that's not an easy thing for us to deal with. Um, and unfortunately it gets more complicated when we start talking about things like consent and informed consent, because this is where most ethical review boards are going to come in and say, you know, you need to get consent or you don't need to worry about consent because that information is already available on a social platform. So the assumptions that we often make is that because I shared something on Instagram or because I wrote a comment on a newspaper article on NewYorkTimes.com, um, therefore, I don't need the consent for anyone that wants to use that information for any other purpose. And again, I think this gets complicated. I don't think it's quite an easy calculation for us to say that just because I shared it openly here means anything goes. I worry that too often that's how some research oversight is looking at content when we're looking at uh, compliance you know, with the common rule for those of you that are aware of how IRBs look at these kinds of, these kinds of issues. I think we need to be really careful about what users understand about how open platforms are uh, my colleagues, uh, Casey Fiesler and, and Nick Proferis recently published a paper asking Twitter users about, you know, how aware are you that there is a uh, interface that researchers can use to access all of your tweet history if they wanted to do a study. And unsurprisingly, the majority of people did not have any real understanding that that kind of access was out there. So we need to be careful about how we think about consent. It's really sort of created a lot of interesting challenges for us as researchers on how to how to address this, this particular problem. I think more fundamentally, we have challenges around how we even define human subjects, how we even define what falls under the review of something like an ethical review board. Um, at a university. Um, I have many colleagues uh, who now um, I work with in, in computer science and computational uh, uh, disciplines that were never used to thinking about humans in their research. You know, I study data, I study networks, I study systems, and they really don't understand that there's a human at the end of that, you know, chain of that, of that database. And that's been a really interesting challenge for us. It's been a really hard gap for us to overcome is how do we get our, our colleagues that are used to doing computational work, but are now using data from social platforms to still recognize that there's a human subject they need to worry about, even if they're just creating a social network map um, or a vector diagram or whatever it is they might be doing with that data, there still could be an impact on a human subject, or perhaps not even on a subject, but on their broader community. What does it mean if we're gonna start studying data from a certain community online? And do we have to think about what those kinds of um, stakeholders might have uh, will have to say about, about that research practice? And this comes to a question of harm. And when all of us are thinking about things like ethics, we're generally thinking about how do we minimize harm? Um, how do we balance um, any kind of social benefit of a research practice to any potential harm or risk to a subject? And again, this is another conceptual gap that we're forced to kind of rethink when we're dealing with this kind of social data, because we often assume that it's already public. We often think that people don't need to give consent. We often may not recognize that there's human subjects there. So we have a hard time recognizing how harm could even happen. And some of that is because, especially I think in, in the US 
regulatory context, we think of harm as having to be tangible. We think about physical harm. We think about financial harm or identity theft or things that are really specific that we can point to and say, I was harmed by that research. It's harder for us to grasp harms that could come through maybe a loss of dignity, um, a, a, a misrepresentation uh, of one's identity, um, the loss of personal autonomy. Uh, I think that's an interesting space that we really need to start thinking about as a research community. Um, I think one helpful way for us to think rethink harms is to use language like wrongs. And this is starting to come up a little bit more in some legal scholarship um, around privacy, that we shouldn't think about something, something doesn't have to specifically and tangibly happen to someone. It could just be a wrong. And that's a that's a it's a nuanced difference. But I think from a from an ethics standpoint, it makes sense for us to, to be trying to expand a little bit when we think about the possibility of, of harms when we're evaluating different kinds of protocols. So I'm throwing a lot of like open issues and open questions. Um <laughs> and and it's it's not easy for us to solve this. Um, we have lots of blind spots in the research community. We have lots of researchers who really just hang on to the, but the data is already public argument. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to push back against that. We still have institutions and researchers that are capturing faces and images online to train algorithms to do things that might be questionable, um, like trying to train uh, an algorithm to predict criminality, which is a very kind of, 18th century concept, but people are still doing this. Um, we have lots of uh, people who are intending to do good things with data and with, with algorithms and training systems who often fail to recognize their role as an ethical agent in this process. Too often they might just say, I'm just the coder, I'm just the engineer. How someone uses that um, face recognition system isn't my concern that someone else's. And we need to spend, I think there's a lot of work for us to do to sort of bring those folks back into this fold. But you do need to think about things like harms and wrongs and the ethics at play. So one of my colleagues, Katie Shilton, had thought about this for a long time, has written about how there's lots of disagreement in this area. A lot of the issues that I'm bringing up um, are unsettled. Um, one of the things we did is we grabbed a few other colleagues and created a, a large project uh, that got funded by the NSF to explore this issue. How do we help computational researchers work through these issues? Uh, we set up you know, many different stakeholder communities, many different ways to try to tackle this through this Pervade project, which we are just wrapping up right now. Um, we were able to put out our little manifesto um, where we actually borrowed a lot from um, anthropology as a domain that has struggled with issues of power, issues of positionality, um, how do they relate to their subjects uh, when you're out in the field doing some kind of anthropological research. And we tried to pull some principles from that discipline to help our data scientists, our computational scientists um, address and, and sort of help them, give them a tool, uh, sort of a toolkit to help deal with issues around, around power um, within within their own day-to-day -day activities. Um, so we could talk more about these issues as well. Um, but I do want to present just two quick cases before I flip the video back around. Um, next week, I'm visiting um, another university up in Ann Arbor um, and talking with their IRB community about um, some different cases. And I wanted to share a few of those just, just with the, this group today. Um, in case you wanted to talk a little bit more concretely on, on some cases that might be a little bit more focused in the health um, and biomedical space. Uh, but I think they're really interesting. And, and one just has to use deal with this increased use of social data. Um, I am seeing a, a great increase in um, both the social behavioral sciences, but also biomedical and public health spaces trying to use social data uh, to train models. You know, we're all trying to take advantage of algorithmic systems, uh, machine learning, uh, different types of automated systems to um, increase the effectiveness of our work, the effectiveness of public outreach. This happened during COVID. How can we track uh, outbreaks? You know, how can we be perhaps using things like Twitter feeds or Reddit forums or comments on YouTube videos uh, to try to engage in better public health surveillance 
uh, better identification of when someone might be falling ill. Employers were interested in this. Can I create some camera systems so I know if my factory's uh, work staff um, is feverish or not? And how do I automate that, those kinds of processes? So this created all kinds of new technical challenges about the use of social data to help train algorithms. What's interesting here in these, this case, you know, this is almost always for some larger social benefit around public health. So it's a really interesting ethical uh, calculus for us to make. This isn't like Facebook just wanting to sell more ads, but these are public health officials wanting to make sure that we're surviving a pandemic. Um, so this is a really uh, interesting set of, of ethical challenges just around the broader use of social data in machine learning kind of, kind of contexts. Um, and a second case I just want to bring up uh, very briefly um, uh, has to do with combining data. This is one of the real powerful benefits of using social and big data in these kinds of spaces. Um, but imagine a scenario where we're trying to build um, an algorithm to predict uh, suicide ideation uh, based on past medical history. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this, this can be quite helpful. Um, there have been work being used to use natural language processing to look at the medical records of you know, tens of thousands of patients who we know did have suicide ideation. And what could we learn to that from that? What kind of patterns can we find in their medical health history that might help uh, us create a prediction algorithm to prevent future instances of this? Um, it's also been suggested uh, that we can improve those kinds of predictive algorithms if we bring in more data. Can we bring in social data? Can we bring in what's called derogatory data? Have you had an interaction with law enforcement? Um, have you had a change in uh, your address suddenly? Have you had a bankruptcy filing, a divorce filing? Um, these are all publicly available information that could be very um, instructive and have high predictive value if we're building an algorithm around a suicide risk. Um, LexisNexis, which is a data broker, um, has a, a, a data file uh, of exactly this, of about 400 different socioeconomic health attributes to help make these kinds of predictions. So the question raised is, is it okay for us to take this social and derogatory data and combine that with your medical health record data in order to build a suicide ideation predictive algorithm? I think that's a really interesting question that creates all kinds of interesting challenges about the appropriateness of combining data sets, um, the appropriateness of uh, whether or not to even create some such type of a predictor and what does that score mean and how do we interpret that kind of score um, and how should we even be, be sharing this kind of information uh, with other practitioners. So this is an actual case that I've been working on with some, some other researchers and would be happy to talk more and engage more with that. So um, that's my um, 10,000 miles an hour uh, overview <laughs> of some of the things that, that I've been thinking about um, in this space. And I'm happy to sort of turn it over to, to Jesse and, and Joe to see what else we want to try to uh, discuss in this conversation. Thank you for that in-depth overview. Um, why don't we start with Joe? You could sort of um, talk about your own work and how you've been thinking about these ethical issues. And then Jesse, you can follow up. Sounds good. And uh, thank you, Michael. Great way to launch us and lead us forward in this conversation. Um, one thing I want to start off with is saying good job in terms of not mentioning the University of North. Uh, as somebody who did their grad work at the university, it's wise from the audience standpoint, not, not go there. Um, in terms of moving forward and where, where, where my kind of positionality is, where I anchor myself on some of these conversations, um, from a public social media data standpoint, I'm responsible here as an assistant, uh, well, I'm actually an associate professor now, as of this month, uh, in the School of Communication and Translational Data Analytics Institute um, for teaching social media analytics, as well as thinking about how we can manage access to the tool that we use, whether you call it a platform or a, a data broker. Uh, we work with this uh, company, Infigy, uh, which allows our students to get some experience doing market research and think about how social media data is being used in industry. Uh, as well as provide our researchers here in the School of Communication uh, and outside the School of Communication with this access to data. Which all to say, uh, I'm uh, aware and, and dealing with some of these issues and, and people come to me regularly with these questions of, of you know, what are the IRB guidelines? How do we deal with some of these ethical quandaries that are being raised uh, by this type of data that's so novel? 
Um, in terms of my own research, I'm anchored to social psychology and communication. So really thinking about the social psychological implications of working with and using communication techno uh, technologies in daily life. Um, I specialize in mobile and social media habits. And so I'm thinking about it more from a psychological standpoint of what can we, what are the implications of using social media? But I do use digital trace data and try to pair it with social media data at times. Uh, I'm sorry, digital trace data and survey data uh, to get both that more psychological lens that we've traditionally used, like from survey work, um, along with the new kinds of angles that we learn from about people and how their minds and habits work from digital trace data. Now, in my work, I mostly do focus on private data where we go to people, we ask for their different from the conversation we're having today. Um, but in some ways, that's uh, provided me with an interesting angle on how to think about some of these ethical issues um, and, re and really think about the spectrum, right? Moving beyond the binary, as Michael was talking about, of this is private, that's not private. Um, and, and, and really, it's made me hesitant, honestly, to work with more public social media data in my own work, despite the fact that as part of my teaching and service responsibilities here at OSU, um, I'm trying to provide the, you know, the resources that we have. Um, and so when people do come to me, I think that that kind of raises the um, the question that uh, Dana was talking about, which is what is the biggest issue we're facing is I don't always have, always have a great answer, which is that there are a lack of clear, firm norms and guidelines that come with this working with this type of data. And so, you know, typically I'm like, well, you kind of want to check in with your research community. You want to be thinking about how the data matters for your research questions you still want to consider what the IRB means here, and Jesse will weigh in on that, given her own expertise and, and, and affiliation with the IRB, I'm sure. Um, and, and so, but it, it leads me in this awkward position in some ways of, well, I'm not the IRB, and, and I want to know how to tell people to go in the right direction in their own work. Um, and, and so that's partly why I've appreciated the work that Michael and Jesse have done. I'm hopeful that these kind of conversations will advance us forward in thinking about how do we deal with this type of data in a more contextualized way? And can we come up with more firm guidelines and norms that are based around different research communities, whether you're in psychology, communication, or computer science, like Michael's talking about, and whether you view yourself as an engineer or just a social scientist. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully we will have a, a, a good amount of time to discuss that today. Uh, I don't wanna delay that discussion anymore. Thank you. Jesse? Hi, so um, I, my research broadly is about different forms of technology and media and, you know, specific to this conversation, I do do a lot of work on social media, but, you know, like Joe, I, I work with people and I am obtaining consent um, and, and trying to get that information um, directly from participants as opposed to doing things like uh, social media scraping. Um, I, I really, Michael, thank you for your talk. And I really enjoyed a lot of those things. It's very similar to a lot of the things in my personal lens in terms of thinking uh, not as public-private being dichotomous. And um, my other thing that I always tell people is, well, whenever in doubt, just replace the phrase data with people's personal information and see how that feels. <laughs> and when it starts to feel icky, that means you've probably crossed a boundary or you need to rethink your approach. Um, because I think that's a big issue is the dehumanization and like, again, extracting information from people and forgetting the people behind that information and keeping the people and communities from whom that was farmed out of the picture. And I think that that's a big goal here is making sure that people are doing right by other people because researchers are people and participants are people. Um, my other side of this is that I am the vice chair of the social and behavioral sciences IRB. And so I can speak to IRB related issues. Um, a lot of that stuff is, you know, I have my opinions and then we have practices that are governed by federal and state regulations. So um, my personal practices are not always in line with IRB practices because, you know, some of my concerns are actually deeper than where the IRB is because I do think most IRBs and federal guidelines are out of whack. As Michael pointed out, they're just really kind of set, you know, 20 years ago and, and need to really take into account uh, especially with, you know, the ability to do machine learning and, and algorithmic training of, of data that we need to be thinking about this bigger picture. Thank you. And that's like, thank you so much for um, also presenting like where you're coming from and your uh, roles at OSU. It's really helpful. And I would love to get to some of the questions that, and the, that you've already brought up. Um, so just so the audience knows, 
Um, there is a Q&A like tablet at the bottom, uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask questions throughout. We should have, um, I'm gonna start off with some preset questions. And then in like about 15 minutes, we're gonna go into your questions. So start asking those questions. One of the questions that has already come up is, is this recorded and will this be available? Yes, so we're recording it. Um, look back at the C Center for Ethics and Human Values website where you registered in about a week and you'll be able to see the uh, conversation there. Um, so maybe before we talk about like the potential gap in the regulations, I kind of want to have a just like an overview from your perspective about what is like distinctive and special about like social media data that is publicly available? Like what is most exciting to you about using public social media data sets for research purposes? Um, Joe also asked like already sort of started highlighting what your greatest challenge is. But one further thing that I think is an interesting question and in some ways Jesse touched upon it, like, you know, asking like, what are the research questions that we're allowed to ask and answer using this data that we wouldn't have been able to ask or answer using other sort of more traditional data sets. Um, so um, why don't I start with Michael and then um, Joe or Jesse, if you wanna follow. Well, I think one of the most exciting reasons for using this kind of data is that you can really kind of improve some of the diversity of your data sets. You know, you're able to reach populations that normal, you know, or, or standard research interventions may not get to. So you can suddenly hone in on certain communities or geographies or, or whatever it might be in terms of what your, your research question might be. And that's also why I think it's so exciting for many of our students uh, and graduate students who are really trying to do some work that others of us hadn't thought of before and can really go in and get data that really you know, you know allows you to, to fine tune on, on certain aspects of our digital lives or, or, or even our offline lives that just might be reflected in online communities. Um, I think that's also what creates some interesting challenges. And I, I can hold that thought for a moment, but I, I do think there's a, there's some great benefit on on being able to expand um, who's represented in research because we can leverage online and social data. And there's some real real great benefits there, both in terms of you know medical research, but but social sciences and other research as well. Absolutely. Uh, I would echo that. And I would say that, you know, one of the things I try to project to my students who are in, uh, you know, undergrads who are taking social media analytics is that, you know, the role here, especially these uh, platforms that exist in industry, and I, I do want to kind of parse at some point the difference between that academic versus uh, marketer versus uh, internal researcher at company division, because I think it does it does have different questions. But we'll come back to that, I think. Um, but what I tell my students is, you know, what, what they're doing is they're providing diverse perspectives into one room um, in, in ways that we often wouldn't see, especially in a, in a public environment. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, that's exciting to see the public sphere in quotes, you know, as much as we can critique that uh, Elon things aside, uh, we, we can think about how, um, you know, this is a distinct environment to understand both social environments at large, which is why you get sociologists and social scientists more generally interested in it. Um, but also for those of us who are in communication, you know, we care about the medium and the role of technology and how that's changing people. So, I, you know, I like to think about how this data is both a way to think about technology effects and communication itself, as well as study these broader human uh, psychological processes. And Jesse, do you want to also, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about like, you know, why, what is special about this kind of data set as opposed to the data set where we we get the prior informed consent, you know, um, and traditionally, yeah. Sure, um, I, I do want to echo like Michael's previous points. It is nice, of course. We, I'm sure Michael already has this point in the back of his head too. But you know, there's the asterisk of yes, we get more people involved, and that's really exciting. But the point when we do this without consent, you know, when we're scraping queer people's, uh, you know, faces and creating an algorithm so that we can out people, for example. Um, like Kowalski's work, um, you know, that's where we get kind of to the point of yikes. Um, but, you know, generally that's a very valid point. You know, I think it, it does help in that, and that's that whole tension we always have ethically of like balancing those things and, and trying to do right by that, by inclusion. 
um, but also having to balance that against that. And I think that's that's a really great point of, of a strength of this research, but also hinting at that other tension. Um, I think for me, like I think as a, especially as a communication researcher, as a social scientist, a lot of it is, you know, if you are ask any social scientist what their dream study would be, it'd be like, oh, I want to plant some video cameras in the space and capture organic naturalistic communication, you know, whether that's um, oh, I want to do this with married couples having an argument um, or, or whatever. These spaces where we feel people are behaving more naturally, um, which isn't 100% the case in social media, but it is more naturalistic than a lot of the data we have. Um, and, you know, the, the idea that people, some, you know, we do know that a lot of people don't have that sense of awareness. They don't feel they're being monitored or, you know, the people they think are monitoring them are not necessarily researchers, which for the validity of scientific research is important. You know, we need those cases. And also in the IRB, we do that too. Sometimes we're like, okay, we can bypass consent here because it is really important to get something natural and real. Um, and if you tell people they're going to behave in a different way. So I do think that that's, again, one of those tensions that we see, but is a big advantage of, of these type of data. So I, let's, yeah. Oh, sorry, Joe. Let me put leapfrog on that just for one second, which is to say, I think the naturalistic point is, real, is, is really key there, especially from that researcher angle. But I also think it's a good way of kind of elucidating that tension in a different way, which is um, just as one kind of example. In the first week of my teaching for social media analytics, I had my students go download one of their own data sets from one of the social media platforms, which a number of them allow you to do, and just go through what you were posting as you were in high school and when you were younger, and think about how you're, you know, what was your mind frame? Were you aware of what was going on now? And I think both you reveal that naturalistic nature, but you also reveal the, you know, the vulnerability, and students have very different perspectives on when they look back on what, whether they, what their consent was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, so this is sort of jumping into the question about regulations and this actually already, I'm going to jump into one um, question from uh, the audience that reflects also like one of the questions. So, you know, I'm wondering whether you actually think that so this kind of publicly available social media data, if you consider it human subjects research, and if you think that the regulations need to change in any way to like match that view and um, the attendee also asked, so this is for Dr. Fox, so maybe you could start um, first, Jesse. Um, given that you adhere to standards behind IRB, what are those standards in an ideal world? What IRB protocols would you like to see at, put out in place, given that the IRB is frequently um, very rigid and based on a decision uh, trees when research ethics frequently needs to adapt and account uh, for context as we've been talking about it. Absolutely. So I, you know, I echo a lot of uh, Dr. Zimmer's points in his talk where it's, you know, we can't just go by this, oh, public versus private. Like that's useless terminology. I'm like, so if someone went into the Oval and they planted a bunch of video cameras and, you know, video recorded all of your private conversations that you're having with your friends, um, would that be public or private? <laughs> and that kind of example usually makes people pretty uncomfortable because they think about the things they're saying, um, you know, out just chatting with their friends casually and would they want that stuff be public and oh well if I didn't put your name on it that would be anonymous right <laughs> um, because we also don't understand what it means to actually make data anonymous I also avoid using that term because it is very unhelpful so I always talk about not even levels of de-identification but levels of identifiability how identifiable is this data and a private conversation you have with your friends Maybe some random person on the internet is not going to be able to pick it out, but maybe you are, and maybe your friends are, and maybe all the people who know you could identify you just by hearing, you know, language you use or expressions you use or nicknames that you might use. Um, so all of those things are kind of uh, aspects I think that we have to think about when we evaluate this from a regulatory perspective. We're supposed to be asking about how identifiable data are already, um, and I think that that's kind of to me, the easiest way to kind of notch in there is talking about, well, this is the way we're doing it. Um, the other thing I think we have to think about is something in COM and other fields you refer to as affordances, and that's the moment you create a data set, you are changing the dynamic of that information. Like right now, I could go on to social media and delete, you know, my, my what, X's, whatever, 
thanks Elon. Um, <laughs> so, um, or I could, you know, take down an Instagram post and I have some control of that, or at least for the future from some people gaining access to it. The Mona researcher collects that into a data set. They are taking some ownership of that. They are controlling the privacy and the boundaries outside of what the user is at least assured by the company. So you have created something there. And I think that's another thing that we have to think about is when we're creating these data sets, especially when people just take them and put them on the internet. That's just really kind of out of the scope and boundaries, I think, of what um, could be permissible in this context. Personally, that's what I, where I think it's like, because again, you have changed the rules, you have made that persistence, you have taken uh, kind of the rights of the owner of that information without their consent, and then created this other thing out of it. And I think that that's where we have to start thinking about that from a regulatory perspective. Um, so there are other ways you could use that data without kind of creating that public data set, for example, that might be acceptable. Um, and, and again, like I think the identifiable it, uh, issue is so sticky right now. I'm very hesitant governing on that because we just get, you know, we just get smarter and smarter and smarter with the ways we can kind of identify data, whether that's how many, you know, the pace of someone's conversation, their word choices, like these algorithms are going to get more and more specific and understanding those things, which makes data more and more identifiable over time. And we can't project where that's going to be. So those are just some general ideas of where I think we could go with this. If I could jump in there too, I mean, I think one of the other key challenges that we see from our perspective with, with IRBs in the U.S. context is there's inconsistency. Not every IRB has someone like like Dr. Fox on there with, with the, that perspective. Um, and so depending on where you are, where you're submitting, you might get different kinds of reactions or responses or tolerances. And that's some of that's just the nature of humans judging protocols. Um, but there's also some 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 shortcomings in that if you're a university with an IRB that's really just sticking to the book, you know, sticking to the regulations and the common rule, you're really kind of limited on what you actually would look at or what you're allowed to look at in terms of reviewing, you know, the ethics of something. Um, we, we, we remind all of our researchers that IRBs are not ethics committee. <laughs> they are the regulatory compliance committee. And, and they're actually generally limited to looking at only that particular intervention with a human subject. And mm -hmm. so a lot of what we're describing when we talk about the collecting of data, the sharing of databases, um, might be downstream harms, you know, different kinds of things that could happen to a, a larger community or, or later on when something gets developed and deployed out into the world. But an IRB is really kind of constrained to look at just that intervention of how that data was gathered um, and not so much about long-term effects. And I think that's one of those other limitations that we could try to address if we ever get the opportunity to, to rewrite some of those regulations. I had a question that would follow up on that. And, and I'm just kind of curious what for both from both Dr. Fox um, and Dr. Zimmer in terms of their perspectives on this question that's been raised about uh, like mission creep or like the the potential for IRB to be beyond its resources. And, you know, so how I mean, on some level, we're hearing that we need more IRB clarity. But on the other hand, there's this concern that it's beyond the IRB or that we shouldn't be focusing exclusively on the IRB. And I guess I think I worry that that you get some tension there in some of those mixed messaging. What, the one thing I can speak to is that I've I've been having more and more conversations with colleagues um, in the library field and where suddenly like a data librarian seems like to be a good kind of person to help us think through some of these issues where they have a different motivation, a different mandate around data sharing, around data management, around things like data privacy. And so do we shift some of the oversight from the IRB, which again is a, 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 a limited regulatory thing to a larger kind of research committee on campus that might be driven by different, different people. But now of course, you know, I'm creating more barriers and more bureaucracy. And those are things that we'd have to work through. But but that, yeah, that's I think that's an important question. And it's it's also curious to see how other um, parts of the world do this who don't have the same regulatory constraints and some places don't do anything at all. Others just have localized committees within their their college or something like that. Um, but Jesse, I'm sure you've have have some better insights from from your inside view. 
Well, just hearing the word mission creep just makes me roll my eyes, first of all, um, because I see my job as protecting people. And so that's my job. And uh, frankly, where the regulations end or where the regulations are blurry, then that's my job to do that. I'm looking out for people and I'm looking out for um, things. Also, the people I know who are most antagonistic towards IRBs tend to be the people who uh, need them the most. Uh, so um, just in terms of, you know, and, and I get it too. Sometimes it is very frustrating about the nitpicking and the T crossing and I dotting. But, you know, a lot of times we talk to researchers and it's just obvious to me they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, it's like, I just see my job mostly also as educational, right? So it's like, I nine times out of 10, you just point this out to people and they're like, oh, I hadn't thought about that, you know, and then they want to do the right thing. And I think that that's where to, you know, at least my role in my IRB is like, there's people who are much better about the regulatory, knit, you know, this and this. And I see part of my job is just talking to people about like, hey, have you thought about this? Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I can't prevent you from this because that's not my job, but you should think about this. Or, hey, if you did it this way, it'd probably be better off for everyone involved. And then, you know, a lot of times researchers just are happy to take that cue and do what I see as kind of a, a you know, a, a better path um, in terms of like participant protections and so forth. It's very rare that I see people who are doing that. So I understand the concern of like, oh, well, this is now going to be more regulated and more legislated or whatever. But also when it comes to social media data, like, these things should have been regulated from the get-go. So don't be mad when someone's just like, you You shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> so, um, but that's, you know, my perspective as an IRB person. So let me jump in and start talking about specific issues that um, Michael brought up in the PowerPoint related to harm and informed consent and sort of um, the pervasiveness of this data. So um, this is also a question, the, the audience is asking the same questions I have. So um, I'm gonna combine my question with the audience. So, I mean, one of the things that I'm interested in to hear from you is whether you think that the use of this kind of data set, these data, this data, change our conception of informed consent to research more broadly. How should we think about informed consent when it comes to this kind of data? And the anonymous ad attendee was particularly interested with like TikTok, like TikTok creators creating this like very seemingly public um, videos. Have they consented to research? How should IRB um, or ethics committees think about um, these videos as potential data for research? And how should we think about informed consent? Um, so maybe I'll start with Michael and then um, Joe or Jesse, if you want to follow up. I think these are the really important questions. I I want to provide what I hope would be an easy answer to say that we kind of have to think beyond consent as some kind of magic wand. And I think that's become the problem that um, too often we see something that got consented either because I signed up for a terms of service in 2014 when I first joined a platform or TikTok changed their terms of service last week because they've now created a research API and now we've all agreed to it. We just don't realize it. Um, or data is being shared and it was, I consented to have that research done five years ago, but you know, now someone else is using that data for some other reason. And I think um, I want to be able to say that we should just be doing reconsenting people, but I know that's difficult. Um, I have some colleagues that do this where they um, they're doing uh, they started doing research on Tumblr and it was around body image, and they consented their subjects to use images. They consented their subjects again to share the images in a conference presentation. They reconsented them because now they're going to publish it. So each. Each time that that image sort of moved in its visibility, they went back and got consent. But that's because they were doing with 20 research subjects, not 200,000 of a, of a Twitter data set. Um, so I'm thinking moving towards questions about what is appropriate use, thinking about what is the context in which that data was first shared. Are you respecting that context? You know, what's considered appropriate? And that's where... I'm hoping that researchers, while they know they can't go consent all those people, it's forcing them to stop and think about, is what I'm doing aligned with the intentions when that data was first shared? Am I introducing some new harm? Is there something else I could do instead of using this data? And just creating these moments for like critical reflection as researchers 
um, versus consent being just this magic ticket to now do whatever I want to do because there was some metadata box checked that said consent was given. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm thinking of that. I don't have a full answer, I don't think, but um, that's that's a direction that I see as, as being potentially helpful. I would add, I, I think this is where it, it's hard to make these sort of broad scoping, like here's a rule for everyone because it's going to depend, you know, I, I very much live by the Belmont principles, which are, you know, this idea of respect for persons and beneficence and justice, you know, those were encoded in the 1970s here in the U.S. and, you know, weighing through each of those questions, because in some cases, maybe the societal benefit could outweigh things. Maybe this is a really important issue. You know, Michael was talking about COVID as a case study. So it's like, well, would I want every single person to have to give consent for us to learn things about like COVID transmission, because, you know, that's one way people were using that Twitter data was to kind of track these networks and, and infections and so forth. And my answer would be no, because I think ethically the overall need for society to kind of get that information and, you know, and mitigate this public health crisis would be more important. So I think that's a big part of it is really thinking through um, that. And then again, like just where else can you mitigate harms when you're doing this? So, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I think about like going through to the, to the national park and it's like, you know, leave no trace, right? Like you were there and then you were gone. And so the, the less of a footprint or an impact you can make as a researcher and be the observer, um, extracting kind of findings and so forth, rather than, um, having sort of a, a potentially negative impact there sometimes, you know, and again, that's not always the best place because sometimes you want to have an impact, but sometimes in those cases that can also be um, a thing depending on the goals of the research and, and the scope of the research. So um, I, I don't know if I dodged the question there, but I, I was trying to, <laughs> to weave it in there. So and I, would, and I would say, oh, oh yeah, say, go, Jeff. yeah, I was just going to agree. And I, and I think Michael and Jesse have, have laid out, I think, a great case for a more situated kind of contextualized reflexive way of thinking about consent um i, I don't think any of us would disagree with you know the so-called <laughs> click-through idea that like nobody's really reading these terms of service especially in the states right now a part of me maybe is too idealistic not on the part of americans but the europeans that we could have more policies in place in the future where platforms would be required to collect informed consent. I think even uh, Jesse, at some point in, in, in your work, you suggested like more modular consent processes. Like I could imagine where similar to cookies or when you have the um, on Apple asking an app not to track, that there's at least more direct consent processes in place in the future that would ideally not only give them access to data, whatever that means, but get people to confirm that they're okay with internal research, external marketing research, and scientific research. You know, that's an ideal world, probably won't happen, but, you know, I at least was curious if, if Michael or Jesse would, how they think about those kinds of things. I would jump in and just say the other issue that we always have to circle back to is that's so open-ended, it's almost meaningless, right? So it's like scientific research. Well, are you a good scientist or a bad scientist? <laughs> you know, are you trying to make the, you know, what was coined the gay face algorithm where, you know, you're trying to create something that is to me very obviously harmful and negative, you know, because you think that this is just science and this is what scientists do, or are you trying to do something that's going to benefit society? So um, it's hard, I think, to, to create those broad open rules because people just don't understand what it means. And I agree with you, too, on the GDPR does such a better job of like putting things in plain language. Um, but, you know, I, I, I agree with you, too, that I'm a little cynical about whether the U.S. will be able to, uh, you know, outgun the lawyers at big tech companies to force them to actually make something that, you know, like it, when we do things in the IRB, it's like an eighth grader should be able to understand this. Like that's the, the standard for like adult consent. And there's no reason a EULA shouldn't be held to the same standards, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think we we've seen the same the same issues. I've looked at some of the draft legislation where we're trying to create a GDPR type law uh, in in Congress, and then they have a researcher exception because they do want to allow scientific research to still happen, even though we have protections in place on the use of data. So that who falls under that definition? We just have that exact same challenge. Does does a researcher at Facebook 
you know, count as a researcher, even though it's their internal research versus an, an academic research. And what does makes us special as academics that somehow we're benign forces in the world? Yeah, you know, so there, there's lots of these complications for us to try to work through. So, so maybe I should um, ask this question that I think has sort of come up in the conversation. Um, and it is related to one of the questions related to like the, you know, the ways in which we regulate research and we sort of think about governance over research versus the way in which these companies are regulated and the internal kind of um, information analysis that they're doing that may be quality improvement or whatever. And so sometimes, especially with biomedicine and the biomedical, biomedical sphere of big data, there's been this worry about like double standards where it's like the researchers are held to a higher standard which actually disincentivizes like the people that care about like conducting research for the greater good because there's more barriers there. Whereas like these companies are going to continue conducting these sorts of internal research in this way that isn't being regulated. I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that potential dynamic, whether you think that when we're thinking about academic research, we should be held to this sort of like higher standard and this could potentially set the tone or you know lead the way for thinking about regulations more in the commercial sphere or what your thoughts are um maybe uh joe you could start and then um jesse or michael you could follow up sure yeah no i think this is an is an interesting question and and mostly i agree with you on on both sides which is to say there, there's clearly a double standard um i don't think that's debatable uh, it's just there are different standards if you're in a company or let alone, you know, the marketing side, right? So I talk about with the platform that we have here in the School of Communication, it's like, look, students here can use public social media data. It's a, and and they and even if they weren't in the class that that they're taking, they take internships where they're using it at, at these companies. Um, and so and marketers have free access. There are hundreds of these tools out there. Uh, let alone, you know, actual coders who can who can pull into the API. So it's it it's happening regardless of what us on the in this our little academic circle think. That's all to say, I, I, we should hold ourselves to those those higher standards. I think who who else will, and, and how else are we to have an influence? Which is uh, partly why I appreciate you know the data ethicists like Michael and, and Jesse when thinking about some of these open open data questions. Um, I don't know how to deal with that tension between the fact that a student in my class can do whatever versus, you know, a very caring researcher who wants to do work in this area and is very ethically attuned and, and knowledgeable may run into issues where they can't do reasonable work. You know, that that's something I'm still trying to sort through. And, 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 and I think hopefully we can use this conversation to do so. Yeah. I can say from a, I guess, an IRB standpoint, like, I, you know, we do everything we can to help people get the research done. I know that's not the common perspective, but we're always like, let's work with you. Let's figure out how we can make this happen. Um, and I think that having that proactive attitude, like from the academic side really helps. But, you know, my, anytime people, I get this pushback all the time. Everyone's just like, oh, you're on the IRB, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you're here just to oppress my research. And I'm like, okay. And then I like say, look, my big question is when you say, oh, but all the companies get to do this, um, you know, I'm like, well, are you more ethical? You know, it's like, are you smarter than a fifth grader? I'm like, are you more ethical than Mark Zuckerberg? I hope so. <laughs> um, and the reason I give people that thing, especially when we work at a public university, I'm like, I, you know, I serve the people like I'm the public defender in the, in the office, right? I'm not the defense attorney. I live by a different set of standards and rules, and I am primarily beholden to society and people, not capitalistic forces and money, which is all those companies are driven by. So, you know, if you're uncomfortable with that, then you can go work for those companies um, and do the kind of research you want to do. But I, I do think it's important, especially for maintaining, there's so little trust in science and trust in our public universities right now. I think it's a forever important, but even more important in this day and age that we maintain that trust and we make sure people know that we are here to do this. So I agree with Joe, we just have to accept that. And that's, you know, sometimes that is uncomfortable and sometimes that makes us have to make hard decisions. But I, I do think that that is um, our goal as academic researchers. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't want this to become a race to the bottom, you know, in, in terms of um, 
where, where we set our ethical standards. Um, and I've, I've been lucky to be able to work with, you know, people internal at different social platforms who do have ethics rules in place, who are trying to, to think through how do they use data in ethical ways, you know, whether or not it's because they have a nice strong moral compass or they just want to avoid the FTC or the reputational hit of being caught doing something improper, but, but they are creating processes and procedures. But it's still even there. They have issues about when when does something move from just an engineering A B testing of of a change to something that would that we would consider human subjects research, and so they're struggling with that too, you know. And so, but but uh, there are good people there trying to find guidance and and trying to work through even on the industry side. But that is that is an interesting challenge that we have. So let me go back to one thing that Jesse you mentioned was. You know, I mean, I think it's really important to highlight the nature of the research, the research questions and the priority and the social value of the research. So that's one ethical consideration. But another thing you brought up is the creation of data sets that are these sorts of, and as you describe it, and you could tell me if this is wrong, that actually changes the nature of control over what um, is publicly available. Whereas it's much more fluid when it comes to social media at least from the public facing, like, you know, Facebook might keep all of my data, but I can sort of determine what to post and what to delete. And so I'm wondering to hear from you what you think about ownership and does someone own the data? Does some entity owns the data? And what does, if ownership is a useful way of thinking about some of these issues, because like how does ownership then potentially translate into control over the uses of the data. So like, do, even if someone doesn't have ownership over the data, should they have say if they're the original creators of the data about what research questions end up being asked related to their original posting? Those sorts of questions. Um, maybe we could start with Jesse and then Joe and Michael, you could go afterwards. So, I, I mean, I'm sure, there are probably legal perspectives on ownership and so forth. I guess my lens is mostly those Belmont principles and the idea of respect for persons and autonomy. And I think that that's where I usually approach it in my mental thoughts is like, okay, so, you know, people are, um, if, if you're not getting consent, then, you know, how are you kind of kind of compensate for that? And I think that one way, if you are going to use people's information, use people's data without consent is still trying to do everything you can to maintain their autonomy in other ways. And that's why when I try to advise people on this, I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to take that, then, you know, keep their autonomy in terms of not creating a data set and putting it out there as some persistent entity that then other people can do other things with it. You know, if, if your data is on the up and up in terms of, yes, the beneficence weighs out, like I didn't get consent, but there is going to be a greater public good here and you can justify that, then that's great. And then, you know, so in part of that package, don't create future harms or as Michael said, wrongs by then making this data set available to anyone who wants to use it for any purpose under the sun. And there's a huge push right now um, across the board about like, oh, open data, open data, everyone should have access to everything. And I just think that that's a really dangerous kind of uh, default uh, for a number of reasons. But it also, again, takes more autonomy away from people who, who whom you already kind of strip some of that autonomy away from. Another place where we're seeing these challenges with, with these open data sets is even in cases where a data set gets pulled because of a controversy or a concern around consent, there's copies still floating out there. And I've done plenty of ethical reviews, especially like in training data in machine learning type communities where they're using training data to, to, to tweak, to improve an algorithm, um, where they just say, yeah, this is open data, you know, and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it turns out that that data was actually pulled uh, but these researchers still have access to it or are still using it. Um, and, and that creates some, some new challenges for us in that, in that space as well. And I would Joe. mostly echo um, what Jesse said in, in thinking about, I mean, one, the ownership question from a legal standpoint is, is above me. I'm not a, a policy person. <laughs> but in terms of the human side, um, you know, I, only, I actually only have, I have one published study in which we used data that was collected from a public Twitter API using the platform that we have. Um, and we decided not to post it, uh, even though we do 
share some of my other experimental and survey work uh, on, you know, on OSF, the open science platform for sharing scientific data, um, you know, for the reasons that Jesse's talking about, which is e even though technically it's private, technically the IR we went to the IRB and the IRB said, you can do what you want. Um, it still feels different when we're posting those individuals' identities out there. And I've, I've seen the term at some point um, of a, like a curated public data set, um, which I think is maybe a more helpful way to think about it, because even if something is public, you know, putting aside some of the dynamic dynamic factors like Michael's highlighting that things can go up and down over time over what's actually available, even if you remove data set, um, even just by highlighting certain people within a subset and sharing it in a different place, even if all of those tweets are still linkable to the public source, you're still changing how it's being used and 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 thought about. Uh, and for those reasons, uh, you know, uh, we decided not to share share in that case. Um, so, so I'll just say, you know, going back to this kind of more contextualized view of of pu 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 public versus private data. Yeah, can I jump in real quick? Just as a little educational point, some people don't realize, like they're like, oh, look, it's anonymous. I took their handle off of it. And it's like, I think everyone who's ever used social media at some point posted something, thought better of it and took it down, right? So think mm -hmm. about if that one tweet you posted one time that you were, you know, maybe too many uh, margaritas in that night and said something silly, or you were fighting with your friend and you said something you really regretted and took it down, um, or you said something later and they were like, oh my gosh, I could get fired over this, right? You know, we've all had those moments where it's like, ah, second. So if someone just happened to scrape that in that moment, it doesn't matter if your name's not on it. Things like Twitter and Facebook posts are incredibly searchable. I can take any other tweet on that line, put it in quotation marks and find your identity like this. And I think that that's a good reminder of how identifiable these data sets are and how difficult it is to, to de-identify them. And even if I de-identified it, doesn't mean the other guy did, right? So then we can just link those because we find the common tweet and connect those things. And so linking is the other big real issue that's here anytime you put a single data set out there, how easy it is to connect to other information sources. So um, one thing that has come up in the conversation, in the Q&A that we have, we've touched on, but I'm really interested to hear about how you, how representative of the real world is social media, um, especially given all these concerns related to informed consent. Um, one of the um, attendees asked about, you know, certain um, stigmatized communities that are already very, uh, very aware, like, for example, the transgender community of like the ways in which social media posts make one vulnerable and the way in which research is being conducted. So um, how should we think about the rep like the representation and replicability of the data that is sort of cultivated through these public social media sets um, moving forward? Because Rep reproducibility is also an important ethical question, not just a scientific one. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Joe, you could start and then Michael and Jesse, you could um, follow up. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot recently because we're, we're thinking about doing some studies that really tap into not just is it representative objectively, if we can figure that out, but to just how people think of how representative it, it, some, uh, something like social media is to the world. And you can see just from the questioning that we're getting that that that's clearly on people's minds. Um, but in terms of the questions about how much it reflects society at large, I think it depends a little bit on the research area. Um, there's certainly way in general the answer is no. But <laughs> in terms of are there areas of research where you can get uh, alignment between, for instance, like political views, you know, you know, opinion polls, what I, you know, what issues are salient uh, within a, within societal conversation. Certainly, uh, and people have work that looks at that. Um, so that's a little bit of a non-answer, but yeah, it's yes and no. <laughs> yeah, there's there's been quite a bit of work done just on the limitations of using social data for for a long time. Mr. Hargitay has been writing about this for a long time with the limitations of any kind of online recruitment. Um, and that's again, we have that kind of like that that double-edged sword of being able to. Um, engage in research that focuses on specific communities, but then that creates visibility that could create harm to them. And that is a really important thing that, that I hope all researchers who, who engage in that kind of work are paying attention to. We've noticed this, we've, we've, we're working on some research where we're looking at um, 
about 700 different studies that used Reddit data as its data source. And we, we, we thankfully are finding many instances where researchers would say, look, IRB said this was exempt because it's public Reddit threads, but we were researching you know, a body image subreddit or a depression subreddit. And so we understand our subjects have particular vulnerabilities. So we're going to take these additional steps on, on how we deal with that. So, um, hope, you know, thankfully we are seeing some, some good progress in that, in that part of it. I would just say with representativeness, I mean, you, this is the problem too, is sometimes a lot of researchers are just like free data and they don't know anything about the platform. They don't know anything about how people use the platform either. Um, because there's a lot of selectivity bias that weighs into that. And so when you make that assumption that, you know, you aren't inherently necessarily getting that, you don't know who people really are. So we have a lot of people who are posing as something that they're not online. So if you take that at face value, that can be a problem. Um, and I think that that's the first step is really just knowing because all of these are biased. There's, there is no perfect representation. And so doing the research, knowing the platform or finding someone who does, who can guide you more on um, what your, your eras of bias are going to be is, is really critical in doing kind of conscientious work. Yeah, just, just imagine Twitter data collected this month versus 18 months ago, you know, entirely different right. set of values. <laughs> For sure. Um, we could continue talking for forever. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Joe, Jesse, and Michael for, I, I, I think actually like, um, yeah, the, a lot of questions came up, but one thing that um, I'm really heartened to, one theme that I'm hearing from the three of you is, you know, there are these sorts of conceptual gaps and regulatory gaps, and it's a, a little bit of an open question how to solve this on a governance scale, but, one of the things that I he I heard repeatedly repeatedly through the session is like, you know, you're talking to researchers who want to do the right thing and are asking really important questions. And it's like, that's why these questions come up, right? And people, there's, with all of the sort of leaks and things that we see in the paper, there's all these researchers who choose not to publicly, like, put this as a data set, right? And so um, it's really interesting to uh, hear about those kinds of conversations that people are already having. And hopefully this just starts a, a larger institutional conversation at Ohio State that has already been sparked in different departments about how to think about these issues more broadly and um, comprehensively. So thank you very much for the three of you and your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you all the audience members for asking really excellent questions. Um, and we will see you next week, I mean, next month on the ethics of challenge trials. So. Different topic, but also really hard. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.